And now, without any further delay, let's begin today's event, EMV, a stepping stone to mobile payments, sponsored by Proxama and hosted by Payment Source. And with that, I would like to introduce your moderator for today, Daniel Wolf. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and thanks again for attending EMV, a stepping stone to mobile payments. My name is Daniel Wolf. I will be the moderator today. I am editor in chief at Payment Source and a contributing editor at our sister publication, American Banker. Our presenters today are Nigel Beatty, Vice President of Business Development at Proxama, with a focus on the United States, and Mark Maringolo. Vice President of Sales uh, for the Digital Payments Division in North America for Proxama. And so I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please, please, please contribute them as we go, and then we can get right to them at the end. And uh, take it away, Mark. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of Proxama and my colleague, Nigel Beatty, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today for what I think will be an informative session on two of the hottest topics right now in the payment industry, and that is EMV migration and mobile payments. During the course of this webinar, Nigel and I will provide a market overview of EMV adoption, reasons for issuers to migrate to EMV, and then drill down a little deeper to discuss how an EMV-based payments infrastructure is the foundation and stepping stone to mobile payments. First, I want to provide you with a brief background about our company, Proxama. Proxama is a global digital payments and mobile engagement company. More specifically, we enable mobile proximity commerce, connecting physical and digital assets to enable mobile payments and to drive contextual and direct consumer engagement. We provide solutions to issuers, payment networks, issuer processors, and mobile network operators on a global scale. As you can see, we have implemented EMV and mobile payments and commerce programs with leading digital companies, including Fiserv, Nets, MasterCard, Starbucks, and ICS, just to name a few. Our payment expertise is significant, and our platform has been operating for more than 10 years, issuing, issuing hundreds of millions of EMV cards. For some context, I would now like to highlight the history of EMV and describe how we arrived to where we are today. Back in the mid-1980s, the payment industry was experiencing significant levels of fraud, particularly in France, which ultimately led to the birth of chip card technology. Slowly, as fraud continued in other countries, they too began adoption, eventually leading to the creation of EMV in 1994, which was a joint effort by the major payment networks, Europay, MasterCard, and Visa, who developed the global specifications for chip payment cards, EMV. Over time, other payment networks joined EMVco, most notably JCB and American Express, which ultimately led to widespread adoption, global adoption of EMV. In 2013, the payment networks announced their support for EMV in the U.S. market and ultimately mandated migration to EMV through a card liability shift mandate resulting in monetary consequences to those parties that are not EMV compliant. That deadline is looming now, just five months out. So as a result, the issuers in the U.S. market have begun to accelerate their pace of planning and implementation of EMV. Globally, I just want to provide you with a quick snapshot of EMV adoption according to some of the latest numbers. Recently, there has been a 43% increase in the number of EMV cards in market since 2014 to almost $3.5 billion, clearly sig signifying a commitment to EMV on a global basis. Currently, almost half the cards globally are EMV. Three-fourths of the payments terminals globally are EMV-enabled, resulting in a third of the transactions, which has had a significant impact, resulting in an 80% reduction in credit card fraud in Europe alone. Clearly, EMV migration globally is maturing, resulting in some very impressive adoption numbers. However, there is still a lot of work to do, particularly in the U.S. market, which we're really focused on speaking here today. The current landscape in the U.S. 
As noted, the U.S. is behind any EMV ad adoption for a variety of reasons. However, that momentum really started to build as a result of the card fraud liability shift deadline announcement from the payment networks for the October 2015 deadline. Most major issuers began the EMV migration process in 2011, and most of them are now issuing EMV cards to their cu customers. Increasingly, issuers of all sizes are in the planning stages or in the process of building out the necessary infrastructure, either in-house with their issuer processor or with some other third-party provider to roll out an EMV and be in compliance with the mandated deadline. Unfortunately, adoption has been slow to date in the U.S., and that is an expensive price to pay as the U.S. accounts for more than half of the global card fraud, resulting in billions of dollars in losses. The U.S. must act now, and fortunately, we are beginning to see that movement as the October deadline nears. Simultaneously, there are other significant developments going on in the world of payments that potentially impacts issuers' payments roadmap. With the increased use of the mobile phone for multiple use cases, mobile payments is finally taking shape and gaining traction after years of trials and implementations with limited success in the U.S. market. With the launch of Apple Pay, issuers need to ensure that they have a mobile payment strategy in place as customer demand and use begins to grow and ultimately reach critical mass. There is good news, however. Those issuers who have adopted EMV have a head start because now they have the ability to leverage their EMV payments infrastructure as a stepping stone to mobile payments. October 2014 was a major milestone in the history of payments with the announcement of a mobile payment solution named Apple Pay. Apple single-handedly influenced the payments industry to consider a transition from a card-based form factor to a mobile one with an elegant and value-added consumer experience. With its renowned brand loyalty and admiration, Apple has seen significant traction in a short amount of time. Hundreds of issuers have been able to enter the mobile payment space as a result and have a mobile payment product to offer their customers. Through the initial integration through the payment networks, issuers gained access to Apple Pay has been fairly seamless. Tokenization and Touch ID have also added security and convenience and ease of use, contributing to the early success of Apple Pay. With the early numbers in, two out of three dollars spent on mobile is coming across to Apple Pay. This is impressive for a product that changes how consumers interact with their payment products, really forcing issuers to consider uh, their own mobile payment strategies moving forward. Next up is Samsung Pay. Samsung Pay has to account for the Samsung mobile phone consumers. As the main rival to Apple Pay, Samsung has a unique value proposition to enhance the customer experience and increase utility. Samsung Pay plans to incorporate Magnetic Secure Transmission, or MST technology, which enables payment acceptance at MagStrike readers. Time will tell how successful this becomes, but needless to say, the momentum is clear in this space, with millions of dollars being vested in these solutions. Finally, there are signs that Android Pay will launch sometime in the near future, potentially building upon the Google Wallet, and it will incorporate its own set of features to increase utility and enhance the customer experience. So how are issuers mapping out their EMV and mobile payments roadmap? Some issuers have had a head start by building their foundation with their migrations to an EMV payments infrastructure, some integrating with Apple Pay, others contemplating Samsung Pay and Android Pay. The good news is that issuers can also build out their own payments infrastructure, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure through hosted card emulation, or HCE. I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Nigel Beattie, who will walk you through at a deeper level what it takes to migrate to EMV and why and how it is a stepping stone to mobile payments. Nigel? 
So uh, thank you, Mark, for that summary of where we're at with EMV migration and the move to mobile payments in the, uh, in the US. So our theme for today, as we said, is EMV being a mobile, a stepping stone to mobile. And what we'll aim to demonstrate is that EMV is actually a fundamental building block for a mobile supporting infrastructure. And that investment made now during the EMV migration process will pay dividends during the not too distant and inevitable transition to mobile. So let's review the card related drivers for EMV migration in the US, which even on their own can justify the investment, although as we shall see, this is not the whole story. Uh, EMV has been around since the mid 90s, as Mark was saying earlier, and was designed to primarily as a, a means to reduce uh, card present or face to face fraud. It was a response to counterfeit fraud affecting European issuers where cards were being skimmed in say London or Paris and clones of those cards were being made in the Far East, for some reason notably in Malaysia. And those cards were then used to make large purchases or cash withdrawals before they could be blocked by the issuer. So while the issuing banks absorbed the losses, this was by no means a so-called victimless crime. The profits from card fraud were funding organized drug trafficking and even terrorism. And sorry to say, this continues today, partly funded from the proceeds of card fraud in the US. So EMV eliminates cloned and counterfeit fraud through offline or online authentication, proving that the chip that's been issued is genuine. And it can also attack lost and stolen fraud through the use of online or offline PIN, so-called chip and PIN, which is gaining a lot of uh, interest in the US today. Uh, chip and PIN, of course, has been implemented across Europe and also in parts of Africa. And now that the US is on the track to EMV migration, non-compliance is not an option for card issuers unless you want to become a soft target for fraud. Those card portfolios that have not been migrated to EMV will become the easy option for fraudsters to attack. And the liability shift that comes in from October in the US reinforces that situation. But at the risk of stating the obvious, it only works to issuers' advantage, of course, if they have issued EMV cards. But there's also a customer perception issue. Cardholders want to be reassured that their card issuer is taking security seriously. And if you cannot issue them with a smart card, they're very likely to take their custom elsewhere. So what's involved in migrating magnetic stripe cards to EMV? Well, at the most basic, it's being able to issue the cards and then to process the new authorization data that's produced when they perform transactions. On the issuing side, this entails generating the additional and fairly complex uh, data that's needed to personalize the EMV applet that lives in the chip. Um, and this will comprise card data, for example, PAN and expiry date, security data consisting of keys and certificates, and if you're doing chip and PIN, potentially the PIN itself, and cardholder personal data. But you can also uh, include risk management data if the card is going to be enabled for offline use. So that could be use at uh, road tolls, vending machines, car parks, etc., where online authorization is uh, maybe not possible. And there are a number of options for meeting this data preparation requirement. And as an issuer or maybe a processor, these include acquiring the ability to do this in-house or by delegating to a card personalization bureau. Or for an individual issuer, by outsourcing to a service provider, maybe your existing card processor, if you're already outsourcing your MagStripe card production. Whichever option you select, an important consideration is whether the solution can retain that EMV and chip data that is generated, rather than operating as a so-called fire and forget system. This EMV data has immediate uses for inquiries and problem resolution, but it will play a far larger role in future product delivery, as we shall see as we progress through the webinar. For authorization processing, again, an issuer or a processor can acquire the ability to process in-house, either by upgrading their existing authorization system or by procuring an add-on or a plug-in solution. The plug-in option will minimize the disruption to the uh, business as usual, usual operation. A further option is to delegate EMV processing to various card networks. But uh, this should only be considered as a short-term option. And we shall look uh, in a couple of slides time at the longer-term implications of following that path.
Now, <clears throat> no one is pretending that moving to EMV is a pain-free exercise, but the old adage of no pain, no gain holds very true here. Adding EMV capability to legacy systems can involve a major change, particularly, for example, if customization has meant that an issuer or processor is not running the latest release of a third-party system. Vendors may require an upgrade to a new release in order to include EMV functions, which will require end-to-end -end testing and possibly re-engineering of business processes. And even so, those vendor EMV upgrades may only provide the most basic EMV functions, which will constrain future flexibility. Consider also that experienced EMV resource is very hard to find, and it's even harder to retain. Reading the EMV manuals alone will not equip your staff with the knowledge to successfully implement an EMV migration program. Finding a partner that can support you through this process and provide knowledge transfer may be your best or, or even your only option. But despite these challenges, doing EMV right today will reap rewards down the line. Doing the minimum now will create a future shortfall in capability that will be expensive to fix. Beware also of outsourcing critical business functions to third parties that offer basic capability but will potentially create a lock-in situation where you have little control over costs, but which will also be expensive to move away from. Similarly, delegating authorization to on behalf of services may get you up and running in the short term, but should not be seen as a long-term solution due to the rising costs that will result as volumes of transactions increase as you issue more cards and more EMV-capable terminals come online. At Proxama, we believe that it's always possible as an issuer or as a processor to make a positive business case for the in-house provision of card issuing and processing capability. And the future roadmap requirements are also an important element of that strategy. So what are the benefits to be gained from in-house EMV processing? Well, firstly, control over costs, which can be predicted at the outset and factored into your business plan in contrast to third-party service provider costs that may increase due to factors outside your control. In our experience, the total cost of ownership over three or five years will always be lower than a delegated solution, uh, not to mention the strategic benefits that will result. Uh, second is control. Operating your own solution gives you control over your, your destiny, if you like and means, for example, that you're not waiting in line for a new product launch because uh, another mega bank customer of your service provider has been given higher priority. And third is functional support. <clears throat> As we've mentioned, a delegated solution will almost certainly offer reduced features compared to an in-house solution. For an example, would you be able to support a move to chip and pin if your authorization processing was delegated to a card network? The answer is almost certainly no. So I hope that's made a plausible case for an in-house EMV solution, whether your role is a standalone issuer or as an issuer processor. Um, and given that EMV migration is now a fact and that there's no alternative, where's all this leading to? As some will recognize and many will suspect, all this leads to mobile payments. And the common factor here is EMV. An EMV-based contactless card transaction which uses uh, near-field communications or NFC and an EMV mobile phone payment actually look identical to the point-of-sale terminal. Uh, no wonder the card brands are incentivizing the rollout of contactless NFC terminals uh, and securing the POS terminal acceptance market. And in this way, the downstream benefit for the card networks will be the continued use into the future of their acceptance rails for mobile payments, which will also counter the threat of disruptive elements such as MCX in the POS market. That gives issuers and processors the green light to plan their future product strategies around EMV-based payment products that share much of their capabilities with today's contact and contactless card products. But the long-term strategy of the industry is now plain for all to see. Um, to secure the dominance of the card network's acceptance infrastructure into the future, 
they had to offer services that were not dependent on the form factor of the, the payment token, card, mobile, whatever. And EMV was kind of the only game in town that offered that. Incentivizing EMV adoption by both issuers and acquirers was only the first stage. Uh, endorsing HCE as an alternative to the mobile operator dominated trusted service manager model or TSM model as exemplified by Softcard and then introducing tokenization, its companion technology, which is needed to counter the reduced physical security of HCE was the second stage. And then, as, uh, as Mark said earlier, from left field came Apple Pay, which uh, was a, a typically dramatic announcement in the mold of a Steve Jobs just one more thing uh, uh, presentation. Um, but of course, Apple Pay, as well as being the best kept secret of the 21st century, was developed with the card brand's full cooperation. And then, uh, as stage four, we have the, the followers, the Apple wannabes uh, coming, coming close behind. So let's look at the commonality between EMV card payments and mobile. And uh, there's, there's around a 60% overlap between the functional elements of both solutions. EMV cards and EMV mobile can share the data preparation needed to personalize the payment app in the card or in the phone. Creation of EMV card keys maps directly onto the management of the single and limited use keys that are needed for HCE. And EMV authorization processing shares the same basic crypto functions with additional verification features <coughs> that's used in the HCE world. The additional functions needed for mobile payment support, specifically in the HCE model, are around tokenization, where a surrogate PAN is used in an HCE applet uh, to ensure that the PAN cannot be used to make a viable cloned card or copied into another mobile. And the monitoring of transactions ensures that payments processed by the issuer system align with those processed by the phone. So those components together give you an end-to-end -end HCE issuing solution. But what's different about the usage of these functions in the mobile world compared to the physical card world? The answer is in the ability to respond to and to fulfill requests in real time. To provide the level of customer service that will retain and attract customers, uh, near instant fulfillment of mobile apps is a prerequisite. Those legacy batch solutions that <coughs> maintained your card issuing operation will just not uh, cut it in the mobile world. So does uh, introducing mobile payment issuing as an issuer or processor sound prohibitively difficult? Well, it should not do if the basic building blocks are in place. While the development of mobile today is largely dominated by the on behalf of services operated by the card networks, that's not really a sustainable long-term model, and the portals into those servers will open up to third parties and individual issuers. Of course, it's already possible to operate an independent HCE service today by directly provisioning tokenized payment apps to your customers' mobiles and processing the transactions that result, as long as you meet the card network standards for the mobile payment app itself. The one factor that will facilitate a smooth transition to an in-house mobile capability as an issuer or as a processor is having those foundational components in place from day one and not having to discard your initial EMV deployment solutions in favor of the on-demand and extensible mobile components that you will need to continue to meet your customers' expectations. So let's look at a fully featured example of an EMV-based HCE solution that fulfills the needs of EMV card and mobile issuing and processing. So here's an idealized view of an HCE issuing and processing solution that works for both individual issuers and processors covering both tokenization and HCE app and transaction management by separately deployable but integrated components. Note that the touch points to existing back office systems are limited and so minimize the impact on legacy infrastructure. Any of these components could be substituted by a third party service 
although this can involve additional cost in the form of service charges and potentially introduce latency and performance. I particularly draw attention to the detokenizer function, which is part of the token service provider role as defined by EMVCO. This, of course, has to operate at the same performance level as the authorization system. That could be 10 or 100 or even more than 1,000 transactions per second. Whoever you talk to about insourcing these functions, please ensure they've realized that this requirement exists. I think some have not. So looking at the roles of each component in that overview, here's a summary of the capabilities they need to fulfill. But while there's a lot more detail under the hood, these are the basic functional responsibilities of each. And to pick up on a point made earlier, without retention of the EMV and HCE personalization and device data, it will be impossible to manage the application and, uh, and the mobile phone itself, which are both dynamically changing objects. A record of the latest state and data settings of the mobile application and on the hardware is an essential feature and is needed to support, for example, a cardholder losing or upgrading their phone and wanting to transfer their payment capability to their new device. So starting to summarize, what's the current state of play regarding EMV and mobile deployment? If as an issuer or processor you have not yet started EMV migration or you don't have a plan in place, well, the message is you really need to get moving. When planning your EMV deployment, be constantly aware that card issuing and processing is not the end game. The longer term objective is moving to mobile. You will have to provide mobile capability to your cardholders or as a processor to your issuing clients. So plan now for where you want to be in two, three, four, or five years' time. And if your basic EMV solution does not provide you a roadmap to mobile, and that is where you want to ultimately be, then that's money that's been wasted. So where are you? Which path are you on? Are, are you A or B in this, uh, in this uh, example? Are you looking at short-term expediency for EMV, or are you looking at your longer-term strategy? Taking the easy path today may be initially attractive in terms of upfront costs, but uh, that will certainly come back to bite you sooner than you may think. However, strategic investments they made today with an eye on mobile will repay dividends in the future by facilitating your introduction of mobile payments which is likely to happen sooner than you think. So in conclusion, if you're not doing EMV now, you need to get moving before you are left behind and become the target for fraud. Ensure your EMV solution can transition into mobile without throwing away what you initially deploy and thereby incurring additional costs. If this webinar has flagged up a need within your organization, you need someone to talk to, and so you know where to find us. And finally, thank you for your time and attention. I will now ask Daniel, our moderator, to put forward some questions that have been raised during the webinar for our consideration. All right, thank you, Nigel. Um, and just again, there is a Q&A box. We have some questions already, and we'll get started with those, but it's not too late. If you have any other questions uh, that were not yet addressed, please uh, go ahead and submit them, and uh, we should be able to get to those as well. Uh, so the, uh, the first question from the audience uh, is, is host card emulation, uh, which you discussed in the presentation, the only mobile technology where EMV will be beneficial? Okay, this is Nigel, I'll, I'll take that question. So host card emulation is not the only mobile technology that's around. Um, uh, before we had host card emulation, we had so-called secure element uh, mobile payment models, which was really an attempt to uh, have the equivalent of an EMV chip inside the phone in, in a piece of protected memory called the secure element. Um, now, uh, Apple Pay, for example, is a kind of hybrid solution because that has what's called a secure enclave, which is in the iPhone hardware, where an EMV payment application and its keys can be securely stored. 
And those um, secure element uh, solutions are still around. And uh, notably, when in, in territories where there's been a lot of investment, for example, Canada, um, th those issuers are still proceeding with those, uh, with those solutions. Um, HCE is different because it takes away the requirement for the complex management of the secure element and the need to interact with a so-called trusted service manager. HCE puts the application directly in phone memory alongside your other apps so it can sit right next to Candy Crush, for example, and it's protected by having uh, frequently replenished keys instead of keys stored securely in, in a protected piece of phone memory. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question specifically about uh, Samsung Pay. Will it meet the requirements of EMV? Uh, yeah, so um, Samsung Pay is being implemented in, in two parts. So. There is the regular EMV requirement. I say the question is, is rather the other way around. Right? Will, will EMV uh, figure in Samsung Pay? Uh, and the answer is yes when it's doing uh, regular NFC transactions. But of course, Samsung Pay has this additional option to use uh, mag magnetic stripe technology and through, through a technology called Loop Pay, uh, which does not use EMV. That's doing the equivalent of a magnetic stripe transaction. But uh, just, just to, to the general case is that EMV is the foundation for virtually all types of mobile payment that are performed over NFC. All right, thank you. The, uh, we're, we're getting a few questions about chip and pin or chip and signature in the U.S. Uh, issuers have the option to do either. Um, what is the additional risk? that uh, an organization might experience if they choose to do chip only or, or chip and signature instead of chip and pin? Okay, so um, taking the example of the UK, which was the first country to go to uh, full chip and pin, and I think over 95% of face-to-face uh, -face transactions in the UK now are done using chip and pin. Um, the risk that um, is introduced if you stick with chip and signature is that there is no protection over and above what you have now against lost and stolen fraud. Um, the, uh, a card that's stolen or is just found could be used to still to do a perfectly valid EMV transaction. And of course, there's no automatic checking of the signature itself within the EMV. Okay, you've got exactly the same process that happens now for a signature card used at a point of sale. So sticking with chip and signature is kind of only using half of what EMV can provide. You've got the, the, the protection against uh, counterfeit, but you're not using any of EMV features to protect against uh, lost or stolen fraud. All right, thank you. Uh, another chip and pin related question we received is if we issue our debit cards as chip and pin, will our clients be able to purchase goods online with their pin and still have enhanced fraud protection over just a signature? And uh, how far away are online merchants from offering a pin option online? Okay, so, so the, the use of uh, pin and in fact the use of EMV for, for online is not something that, that has been adopted. Um, EMV is primarily a face-to-face -face technology for what's called card present, or, uh, and in the future we'll, we'll call it maybe phone present. Um, but using um, uh, your card in an e-commerce uh, situation, whether it's card on file or whether you're just doing a regular internet purchase, needs to be protected by, by other factors. Now, uh, one of these which is increasingly common is, is 3D Secure. Um, but we should also mention here that um, another use for tokenization is to allow those card on file merchants to hold tokenized card details rather than real card details. Um, and as we saw with some of the large data breaches which happened to uh, merchants over the last uh, you know, 12, 15 months, um, if the details that were stolen had been tokenized, there would have been no fallout in terms of uh, cloned cards being created from those card details and used to uh, perform purchases or withdraw cash 
uh, from uh, from um, uh, other other countries. Our next question: How does one support bank branded and retailer branded mobile wallets? Uh, okay, um, the, 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 there should really be no difference in terms of the technology that's supported. It really depends who is the issuer for the payment application. So I suppose you could take the analogy of having a bank branded um, credit card and a merchant branded store card. Okay. Um, usually in that situation you find that either the merchant is large enough to be a bank in its own right and can issue its own cards, or it uses the services of a partner bank to do that card issuing for it. And in terms of uh, putting wallets on phones, um, there's, there's kind of no difference in the provisioning technology. There could be two different issuers uh, provisioning mobile applications to different wallets on the same mobile phone. Um, it gets a bit, uh, should I say, clunky when the uh, cardholder has to think about choosing which wallet to use and which wallet to open to, to perform a transaction. So it, it's kind of um, something that will evolve over time. But from a technological point of view, there's, there's really um, no difficulty in provisioning to, to more than one wallet in the HCE model on a phone. Can anyone besides the card networks be the token provider? For example, can an issuer be the token provider? Um, the answer is emphatically yes, and this is explicitly recognized in the EMV Co um, token framework specification. Um, the, the, the intention of the industry is to allow third parties to be token issuers. Um, as well as the card schemes uh, adopting that role, which they've done for the initial uh, implementation of schemes like Apple Pay and, and HCE, uh, purely in order to get them up and running in, in a short time scale. Um, but there is, there is no reason, in fact, there is a, a positive uh, reason for third parties becoming their own token providers. And this, could be, this could be large banks, say tier one banks. It could certainly be issuer processors. Um, and of course, uh, token service provider role covers both the provision of tokens for mobile payments and the generation of tokens for e-commerce purposes. And so uh, a large processor who has both uh, an issuing business and an acquiring business would be very well placed to be the token provider for both, both of those, uh, those use cases. And uh, our next question, how do you see the growth of mobile payments in Europe where contactless limits are still low compared to other markets uh, and offline PIN is deployed by issuers? Uh, okay, so um, contactless limits have been rising in Europe. Um, in the UK, there was a rise just a, just a few months ago. And as, as issuers and the networks become more comfortable with the risk that's involved, I'm sure we will see those those. Uh, limits rise even further. And of course, there is also the requirement for um, contactless to switch to entry of a PIN when certain risk thresholds are, are crossed. And that will be exactly the same for mobile. In fact, some, some of the brands are insisting on the entry of a PIN for mobile payment anyway. Uh, and so the, the contactless limit is only really aimed at uh, enabling the efficient use of the contactless card or the mobile for, say, convenience purchases, whereas other purchases can still be uh, performed contactlessly, but above the limit, the entry of a PIN would be required. What is being done to protect card not present merchants? Okay, so as I said earlier, um, EMV does not currently have a role to play here. Um, the, the solutions that are being adopted for card not present merchants, and I think you've got to look separately as to whether this is supplying card details from the cardholder at the time of the purchase, or whether that card is held on file. Um, we already talked about cards on file being tokenized in the future, uh, uh, and for card details that are supplied at the time of the purchase, then technologies such as 3D Secure come into play to, to verify the identity of the cardholder before that transaction is approved by the issuing bank. Okay. 
Um, one more question is, uh, if the end goal is mobile, is EMV even a necessary step? Why can't I just jump from MagStripe straight to mobile? Okay, so the, 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 the model that's being adopted by most of the card brands is that mobile will be implemented as a companion to uh, an existing card account. Um, it it kind of makes sense that you can either use your mobile or move your card. Now, whether, whether in the long term a physical card will actually be issued on that account, on that account you kind of want the same back office process to apply to both. Um, so that your mobile transactions appear maybe on the same statement as, as your physical card transactions. Um, and for a MagStripe issuer today, they, they, they kind of need to give themselves the protection against counterfeit fraud on their card base, as well as going to uh, mobile versions or digitized versions of, of those same cards. And as, as we've seen, the um, move to EMV for the card issuing business is uh, kind of an important precursor to the ability to um, have a end-to-end uh, -end mobile issuing capability because a lot of the components are shared. And so investment in EMV today is, is money well spent for the future deployment of mobile. All right. We have a question about uh, currency. How does uh, the merchant mobile wallet currency fit in uh, specifically as a competitor to Apple Pay? Um, well, okay. So um, at the moment, um, you can have cards issued that work in different currencies. They have a different home currency, if you like, the, the currency in which the, the account uh, is settled. Um, and, and that will that will not change. Okay, so we we can pursue the analogy that having a mobile uh, payment application issued to a wallet on a phone is kind of just the same as issuing a a physical card in terms of the the, the setup of the the application itself, the app itself. So it will have its own currency, and of course, it's able to perform uh, transactions overseas. Um, uh, as well, uh, you know, using the same processes that are are, are used today. Right. Uh, on, on along those lines, uh, there's a very crowded and confused market of offerings with Apple, Samsung, Google, currency, which we just uh, discussed. Each of them being somewhat different or targeted to different sectors of the mobile market. Um, do you need to support? all of these, what, what does this complexity mean for integration? Yeah, okay, so the, the market is, is uh, getting more complicated and you know, we've seen uh, mobile payment uh, models emerge and we've seen some drop away and no doubt we'll see more emerge and we'll see others that, that will fall by the wayside. Um, the answer is, is to have a flexible and uh, extensible platform uh, if you like to, to, to do that and, and if you think back to the uh, the diagram that I put up uh, during during the webinar um, those components can be swapped in and out to support um, other mobile technologies um, without affecting the issuers back office operation which is the kind of the whole point of having having that uh, platform as an insulating layer uh, between between the issuer themselves and their, their back office processes and the various endpoints that will be used for uh, mobile provisioning and for transaction collection. So it's really having that platform to insulate you against any changes and to be able to have that platform which is extensible to be able to adopt um, other slightly different technologies that may, or may emerge in the future. Okay. Um, I, I see. I, I know we just discussed currency, but we have a um Another question about that, uh, so just figured we'd keep that topic. Uh, how does its impending launch affect the mobile payments landscape? Okay, so well, well maybe that's a topic for, a, for a, a, another okay. discussion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the, this is Mark here. Um, the, the, there is no scheduled launch yet for currency as, as far as we know. I think there's been a lot of talk and rumors over the past few years. So. You know, we'll see how how that goes if and when it is implemented. Okay. 
Uh, another question, if my business doesn't yet have a mobile strategy, does it need to have a mobile strategy in place before investing in EMV? Um, okay, well, that's a good question, and, and the fact that the question has been asked kind of implies that uh, the questioner thinks they do need a mobile strategy, which is good to hear. Um, but I would say that defining your mobile strategy now is, is not a prerequisite to, to defining your EMV strategy, uh, only that when you determine your EMV strategy, you need to keep an eye on the future and recognize that you need to go to mobile so that the solution you select for EMV today is able to be uh, used and can assist your migration over to mobile issuing at the time you choose. So it's, it's, it's not a proof exit right now, but you need to uh, be aware of the fact that if you do plan to move to mobile in the future, the components and the solution you select needs to have that inbuilt roadmap to mobile support. Okay. Uh, we have a question about digital currency. Um, the, the question is, is NFC the next wave of digital currency? Um, I, I guess uh, we could expand that also to where does digital currency fit in with uh, everything we've been discussing? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure there's a whole lot of overlap here. I mean, I, I guess we're talking about uh, Bitcoin and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and kind of as an alternative currency, it's, it's not making any inroads really into the, you know, the, the, the consumer card payment market as such. Um, while there are some merchants who are accepting Bitcoin and it, it's, it's kind of um, being used for transfers between consumers or you know, B2B, P2P, whatever, um, there's really no uh, equivalent in the, uh, in, in the card payment world. And uh, I think NFC here is a, is a kind of red herring. There's been other, there are other technologies around that also use NFC or, or technologies like RFID to do um, uh, P, P2P or P2B uh, payments. You know, and, and we're looking at things like, like uh, electronic purses. But uh, I, I don't foresee any real impact of digital currencies on the existing card and the future mobile payment market for, for a long time to come. Okay. Uh, I wanted to just uh, put it out there again. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, we do have some time left. Uh, please use the Q&A box to, uh, to submit uh, questions, follow-ups, anything like that. Um, well, while we wait for that, I, I could ask the presenters, is there any uh, question you were expecting that uh, you would like to take the time to, uh, to answer uh, that we haven't gotten to yet? No, I mean, I think we've, we covered an awful lot during this session. We hope it was informative to all the participants. Um, I think the, the quality of the question shows that, you know, we have a good audience out there really thinking about these topics, and hopefully we, we were successfully able to address them and okay. provide, you know, further insight into, into what's really an exciting time to be in the payments industry with all these different things going on, different implementations and payments and so forth. So. Okay. We're, we, we're good to go on our end. Okay. Uh, we, we do have another question that came in. If the requirement is chip and pin, but the merchant is only able to support chip and signature, where does the liability fall? Okay. So, so the liability uh, uh, shift at the moment uh, affects the basic EMV function. Okay. So chip and pin is not um, another factor within the liability shift. So the liability shift is about preventing the use of cloned and, and counterfeit uh, cards. Um, it doesn't address uh, any fraud that's uh, uh, lost or stolen uh, in, in nature. And so it's only the, uh, just, to, just to summarize again what the liability shift actually means. Um, if uh, a card transaction takes place and either the issuer or the merchant has not implemented their side of the EMV equation, then if that transaction could have been prevented by EMV, then the liability falls on the party that has not implemented the EMV compliant part of, of the, so the EMV card or the EMV terminal. So, so if the um, if the issuer 
is issuing a chip and PIN card, but the merchant can only accept chip and signature and a fraudulent transaction occurs without the use of the PIN, what, what, uh, who's, who's liable? Okay, in that case, the merchant will be liable okay. and, and the, the issuer will, will have a chargeback right. Okay. We have a, a question that came in about Apple Pay. Uh, the, we, we've been talking uh, until now primarily about the use of Apple Pay at the point of sale, the contactless NFC uh, flavor of it, but there's also an option to support payments within merchant apps. That particular in-app feature, how is that tied to EMV? Um, are these considered card not present transactions? Uh, yeah, these these are card not present. So there, there is no EMV interaction between the the Apple Pay uh, app and and say the the, uh, the 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 issuer host in terms of a regular EMV transaction to perform that. So in effect, it is a card not present transaction. Okay. Is there any added security versus just uh, typing your card number in if you're using Apple Pay for an in-app payment? Um, okay, so it, it's 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 much the same as as doing an in-app payment with your card already uh, lodged on uh, in your iTunes account. So um, uh, that 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 has so far seen very little, if any, fraud. And so the the same features apply to to in-app payments using Apple Pay. Okay. Uh, one, one one more question is. Um, was there a mention of requiring a PIN for NFC or mobile transactions? And if so, who is the party that requires it? Okay, so so the the procedures that will be adopted at, at the point of sale are, are still being um, discussed, shall we say, by the various card brands. And um, without getting into to too much detail about who's saying what uh, at the moment, um, some are saying, yeah, we should have a PIN for all uh, mobile purchases. Some are saying we only need a PIN above a certain limit. Um, there are use cases where using a PIN for a mobile purchase is, is just not practical. So think about using your mobile in a transit setting as you're going through, through a gate to, to get the subway. Um, there, is, there is actually no time to, to, to do a, a PIN entry. Um, even to do a pin entry in advance of going to the gate is just uh, too much of an inelegant solution to make that workable. So the, the, the jury is still out on whether various card brands will have different approaches to uh, requiring pin for, for mobile purchases. Um, but an important point is that whatever is decided, the consumer experience kind of needs to be consistent across different brands. When you use an EMV card today to make a purchase, it doesn't matter what the brand of that card is, the, the consumer experience is the same. And the industry will be storing up trouble for itself if it tries to implement uh, different consumer experiences for different brands in terms of when a PIN is required. But no, no firm decisions have yet been made and uh, discussions or even uh, arguments are still taking place as to what's the best solution there. Okay. All right, um, I think we are uh, just about out of time. Um, thank you uh, to our presenters, Nigel and Mark uh, of Proxama. And I wanted to thank all of the folks who uh, attended and listened in and uh, presented uh, your questions as well, and, and also to those who, uh, who, who just listened in as well. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>